Nullification is a juror's prerogative. So what does that have to do with a contested democratic convention? Don't worry, there's a point to this, I promise. UNFTR. Dreaming of a contested convention? A wild and raucous old school showdown with twists and turns to inject a little drama into this election? You're not alone. Your dream is the establishment's nightmare and they've been trying to prevent this scenario for longer than most of us have been alive. We're gonna walk through what it would take to wind up with a contested convention, look at some historical examples, and then dream a little bit. Dream about a scenario that could get progressives back into the conversation. But first, nullification is a juror's prerogative. This is a little known quirk of the judicial system. A jury of one's peers is designed to be the last line of moral defense, not legal defense. When a judge sends a jury to deliberate, they typically charge them with a particular task to determine whether or not certain legal standards have been met in a case for or against a defendant. But here's the twist. This charge is a performative act that may have been normalized, but it's not formalized. If a jury was designed to judge a case on its legal merits, the jury box would be filled with lawyers. Instead, it's filled with a bunch of people like you and me, without law degrees and with a little time on their hands. And thus, nullification is a juror's prerogative. If any member of a jury thinks that the law being used to condemn a person is unjust, they can vote with their conscience and hang the jury. Also, apportionment is a delegate's prerogative. Can you see where I'm going with this? Let's talk democracy for a moment. For the first couple of years of the UNFTR podcast, we dedicated ourselves to explaining how the past half century belonged to the neoliberals. The inflection point happened as the New Deal era was ending. Stagflation gripped the world economies. Tensions were inflamed in the Middle East. China was entering a new economic era, and Democratic and Republican parties were having their own identity crises. The U.S. was also war-weary. Boomers were entering the workforce. The ozone layer was disappearing. Major cities like New York were crime-infested and on the brink of bankruptcy. Nothing seemed to be working. In other words, it was the 70s. Around this time, conservative legal scholars, wealthy industrialists, and white Christian evangelicals made a pact to grab power over the pillars of American society. And over the next 50 years, they targeted the law schools and the courts. They attacked labor and sought to deregulate industries, cut taxes on the rich, went after higher education, criminalized immigration, stripped away welfare benefits, started charter schools to go after public education, privatized crucial industries, loosened environmental regulations. If it fell under the umbrella of the general health and welfare of the population, then it came under fire from the neoliberals. Every so often, the Democratic Party would position itself against the tide rhetorically, but even their successful programs were stylistically neoliberal and only served to marginally and temporarily shift the tide. In hindsight, the past half century did indeed belong entirely to the donor class, the oligarchy, the inverted totalitarian state, the neoliberals. By any name, it was class struggle. A class struggle as old as time that fits neatly into the Marxian narrative. Haves and have-nots. For the briefest of moments, the Occupy movement illuminated the path and platform figures like Bernie Sanders. But the opposition was armed and ready to beat back the progressive movement that wound up splintering. And I'm not talking about Republicans. I'm talking about the Democratic Party. So this is the project that we've been working on since starting this podcast, to pull back the veil of liberal insincerity that has given cover to the worst instincts of the Republican Party, the real enemy of the people. The Democratic Party is the most useful of idiots. But whether we like it or not, it's also the only mechanism with which we can pull the levers of change. Now, on this, many of my fellow leftists tend to disagree. Many see a third party as the most important political vehicle to affect change, and on the face of it, they're not wrong. But in the present reality, it's beyond impossible to mount a third party challenge. If you saw our full episode last week on the DNC, you'll realize that this is a manufactured reality. Both parties are responsible for foreclosing on the third party option because they control the balloting in primary states have control over their respective donor bases, and have arbitrary rules over the debates. Is it a noble goal to unwind this system? Absolutely. But it's harder than one might imagine. 
Gerald Ford was the only executive never elected to the office. He was appointed as vice president when Spiro Agnew resigned and assumed the presidency when Nixon resigned. So in 1976, there was a question surrounding his electability. The economy had cooled significantly and his pardon of Nixon angered large swaths of voters. So the Gipper himself, Ronald Reagan, smelled blood in the water and took his shot in what became the last contested convention on the Republican side. On the other side of the aisle, the relationship between Jimmy Carter and Ted Kennedy soured over Kennedy's health care bill, setting up a challenge to the sitting president in the 1980 election. Of historical importance, of course, is that neither Reagan nor Kennedy won the conventions, but they left behind some interesting breadcrumbs for us to follow. Let's quickly dig into a little nuance to lay the groundwork. The terms contested convention and brokered convention are often used interchangeably. In the modern era, we actually don't have brokered conventions because much of the math is done during the primary season to determine which candidate will appear on the first ballot in the convention. The 76 Republican convention between Ford and Reagan, the 1980 convention between Carter and Kennedy, and the 2016 convention between Trump and Ted Cruz and a few others are the most recent examples of contested conventions. So this is when the candidates attempt to release pledged delegates before the roll call or when no candidate emerges with a majority on the first ballot. The parties have worked really hard over the years to lock down the primary season and eliminate the possibility of contested conventions as they left a little too much to chance. But as we've seen, contested conventions are still possible because of the nullification example. There's more nuance to this as well. For our purposes, we're going to focus on the Democratic convention process because there's a difference between the parties when it comes to the number of superdelegates. Superdelegate! Pledge delegates operate under the following directive under convention rules. Quote, Delegates elected to the national convention pledged to a presidential candidate shall in all good conscience reflect the sentiments of those who elected them. End quote. So these are the party faithfuls that pledge to support the leading primary candidates come convention time. Superdelegates are from the party elite. Governors, senators, House representatives, and DNC members, and a handful of other power brokers. The Democrats have way more superdelegates than Republicans do, by the way. Now, these people presumably reflect the will of the people. However, former DNC chair and asshole Debbie Wasserman Schultz said the quiet part out loud when she said this about unpledged or superdelegates. Quote, unpledged delegates exist really to make sure that party leaders and elected officials don't have to be in a position where they are running against grassroots activists, end quote. So basically, the party apparatus can theoretically override a tight primary race by throwing its support to the establishment candidate. And in this way, the DNC is way less Democratic than the RNC. There are about 4,000 delegates who will appear at the Democratic convention to cast their votes for the presidential nominee in Chicago. Because they rigged the primary contest in several states and no big-name Democrat came out to challenge Biden, Biden wound up with the preponderance of the so-called pledged delegates. Now here's the fuck part. There are more than 700 superdelegates. The key here is that they can only vote if the first ballot fails to nominate a clear majority candidate. So in a tight first ballot, these superdelegates can shut it down on the second one and put their thumbs on the scale to end things. The Democrats like to pretend that the superdelegates are independent because they're not, quote, pledged, but that's just wordplay and fuckery. It's not the superdelegates that should interest us, though. It's the pledged delegates. So imagine for a moment, that we end up with a contested convention in August. Now, the left wing in Britain and France just showed how quickly coalitions can be built in relatively short order when there's an existential right wing threat looming on the horizon. In the United States, though, progressives have a really big problem on our hands. Whatever semblance of a movement or a coalition that formed around Bernie's campaign has all but disintegrated. The issues that we care most about have also fallen by the wayside. To counter Trump, the Biden administration has made a hard right turn on immigration. It's supporting a genocide in Gaza, allowing the conflict in Ukraine to fester without any diplomatic intervention, putting zero pressure on the Federal Reserve to give consumers a fucking break on interest rates. And the list goes on and on. Now, in typical modern fashion, everything of note was accomplished in the first 18 months of this presidential term, and the rest fell to the cutting room floor. No more talk of Medicare for all. $15 minimum wage? Never heard of it. A path to citizenship for dreamers? How about jail or deportation? The administration did secure $166 billion in student loan debt relief, which is great, but students are still carrying more than $1.7 trillion in student debt. 
The Biden administration has done just enough to keep the economy from flushing down the toilet and to restart a few key industries. But the majority of the country is in more debt and less secure than they were during the pandemic. To quote the president and presumptive nominee, here's the deal. Joe Biden or no Joe Biden, Democrats aren't winning this election. Now, we've been saying for months now that the combination of economic insecurity and the war in Gaza are going to sink the Democrats. Factoring Biden into the equation now, and the figures fall off a cliff. That's why this is our 1976 moment as progressives. The Democratic Party is dead. And as we learned from our discussion with Giannis Varoufakis, the entire system of capitalism that we know and recognize may also be dead or is at least dying. We're in the midst of a complete paradigm shift, and it's time to get organized and dedicate ourselves to the long fight ahead, just as the neoliberals did by running Reagan in 76 and launching their omni-channel campaign to attack the pillars of democracy. Now, Reagan may have lost in 76, but he won in 80, and they've been in control ever since, even when a Democrat was sitting in the Oval Office. Someone asked me to write a letter for a time capsule that is going to be opened in Los Angeles a hundred years from now, on our tricentennial. It sounded like an easy assignment. They suggested I write something about the problems and issues of the day, and I set out to do so, riding down the coast in an automobile, looking at the blue Pacific out on one side and the Santa Ynez Mountains on the other, and I couldn't help but wonder if it was going to be that beautiful a hundred years from now as it was on that summer day. And then, as I tried to write, let your own minds turn to that task. You're going to write for people a hundred years from now who know all about us, we know nothing about them, we don't know what kind of a world they'll be living in. And suddenly, I thought to myself, if I write of the problems, they'll be the domestic problems of which the president spoke here tonight, the challenges confronting us, the erosion of freedom that has taken place under Democrat rule in this country, the invasion of private rights, the controls and restrictions on the vitality of the great free economy that we enjoy. These are our challenges that we must meet. And then again, there is that challenge of which he spoke, that we live in a world in which the great powers have poised and aimed at each other horrible missiles of destruction, nuclear weapons that can in a matter of minutes arrive in each other's country and destroy virtually the civilized world we live in. And suddenly it dawned on me, those who would read this letter a hundred years from now will know whether those missiles were fired. They will know whether we met our challenge, whether they have the freedoms that we have known up until now will depend on what we do here. Will they look back with appreciation and say, thank God for those people in 1976 who headed off that loss of freedom, who kept us now a hundred years later free, who kept our world from nuclear destruction. And if we failed, they probably won't get to read the letter at all because it spoke of individual freedom and they won't be allowed to talk of that or read of it. This is our challenge. And this is why here in this hall tonight, better than we've ever done before, we've got to quit talking to each other and about each other and go out and communicate to the world that we may be fewer in numbers than we've ever been, but we carry the message they're waiting for. We must go forth from here united, determined that what a great general said a few years ago is true. There is no substitute for victory. Mr. President. That was it. That was the moment in 1976 when Reagan won the election in 1980. Gerald Ford was the incumbent, but many believed him to be illegitimate. The GOP establishment was fearful of a challenge from the right under the populist former governor of California. He's just an actor. He's a radical. A vainglorious, prompter-reading, shallow Hollywood avatar of a cheap political stunt. So they begrudgingly mustered the support ahead of the nominating convention to stave off the attack from their right flank. But to a younger generation of Republicans, Reagan represented the future. He was bold and polished, glib and handsome. 
forward-thinking rhetoric brimming with promise and idealism for young people in a throwback brill cream package for the older generation. In the end, the establishment had the numbers, and a dejected Reagan was sidelined. And even though there was clear acrimony between the two men and their camps fought bitterly, Ford took the high road and invited Reagan to address the convention. And rather than appear petty, Reagan seized the moment, graciously thanked the president, and addressed the crowd, bringing the thousands of raucous attendees to a hush. It's been reported that several of the four delegates, especially the younger ones, actually wept at the conclusion of the speech and regretted their decision to tow the party line. And then last week on Morning Joe, President Biden said this. If any of these guys yeah. don't think I should run, run against me, go ahead, announce the announce president. Challenge me at the convention. So be it, right? The only question is, who? If we're to believe the armchair pundit class, it's Governor Handsome Winsome Loosome Newsome or perhaps Governor Whitmer. The non-existent K-Hive is still trying to make Kamala happen. But where are the progressives in all this? Where's the next Bernie? Up and down the progressive caucus, whether it's actual progressives or in name only, they continue to back Joe Biden and say he's going to be the party nominee. Pretty much everyone in the caucus, except for maybe Rashida Tlaib, is on record already saying that they still support President Biden. Is it cowardice? Hardly. Democrats are getting a taste of their own medicine from the squad. Imagine if AOC came out forcefully against Joe Biden right now. Democrats would hang this inevitable skull fucking that Biden's about to get around her neck and any other squad member that dared to challenge the DNC. It's a non-starter. And frankly, I applaud it. So the real question becomes, what's the 2028 plan for the 2024 convention? Let's assume Biden continues to lose ground in the coming weeks. The DNC will have no choice but to start cooking up backroom deals for Harris. Now, maybe it's Newsom, considering he's been hanging around Biden like Dracar Noir. This stuff is Dracar Noir, man! That's an 80s reference to bad cologne, and yes, I did wear it. Perhaps it's Whitmer, since Harris's poll numbers are as shitty as Biden's. Are progressives really going to sit back and just swim with the tide? Maybe. Or maybe there's another way. So let's dream a little dream. To counter Project 2025, I propose Project 500. Forget it, he's rolling. For the sake of round numbers and to make a fantastical point, let's focus our attention on a handful of states. There are 124 delegates in Ohio, a swing state. 159 in Pennsylvania, also a swing state. 82 in Wisconsin, swing state. Georgia, 108, swing state. There are two uncommitted delegates in Michigan already, swing state, thanks to Rashida Tlaib's grassroots movement during the primaries to protest Biden's support of the genocide in Gaza. And rounding us out to 500 is another 25 delegates in New Hampshire, a state whose motto is live free or die, but might as well be fuck off and leave us alone. We're doing our own thing up here, so suck it. As a practical matter, the states are meaningless. Any combination of pledged electors from across the country to get to 500 will do just fine. But focusing on the all-important swing states sends another level message to the establishment. Of course, the DNC is trying to prevent this kind of shitstorm that occurred the last time they did this in Chicago in 1968. But while they're thinking about something that happened in Chi-Town 56 years ago, I find it helpful to go back a bit further. 144 years ago to 1880, when the Republicans, which were actually more like Democrats at the time, held their nominating convention also in Chicago. Rutherford B. Hayes had declined to run for re-election, which opened the field to office seekers from across the country. The lead candidates for the nomination were James Blaine, John Sherman, and past president Ulysses S. Grant. And over the course of several days, support shifted between the three men and some others, such as William Wyndham and Roscoe Conkling. But it was a quiet and respected brigadier general turned congressman who spoke on behalf of John Sherman that wound up captivating the throngs of exhausted and frustrated delegates at the convention. James Garfield. Garfield's speech was so well received that people forgot that it was about John Sherman. So much so that on the next ballot, his name was floated and he won. The reluctant Garfield became one of history's greatest what-if leaders as he was assassinated shortly into his term and he never executed the duties of the office. So in the modern era, it's beyond unlikely that a contested convention could erupt into such mayhem that it would produce a happenstance nominee. But it's a hell of an opportunity to pull a Ronald Reagan and groom a successor to Bernie Sanders and get the progressive movement 
back on the rails. So here's what I would propose if I had a magic wand or an actual following. Now bear with me here because it's a mix of progressivism and realism. Draft Jamie Raskin and Pramila Jayapal. And let me balance this up front by stating that they're both weak on Gaza. Despite calls for a ceasefire and votes against continued funding of Israel's war, they can and need to do better. Even though we certainly don't need another white dude at the head of the ticket, Raskin fits the bill because he's progressive, intelligent, a skilled debater and legislator, and has a higher profile than most due to his efforts leading the January 6 investigations. Now, Jayapal is head of the Progressive Caucus. She's a woman of color as well, so that balances out the snub of establishment VP Kamala Harris. And she's also skilled in the art of backroom deals. Now, I know this all sounds cynical, but let's keep going with it. These are professionals who get it right most of the time, and pretty good is better than nothing. And Raskin is also the type of player that could secure a speaking slot at the highly orchestrated convention proceedings without raising too many eyebrows. In him, we're most likely to get our Reagan 76 moment. I would just have to get my man over to the barbershop. I also believe that they've learned hard lessons about negotiating with the bad faith core of establishment Democrats who've been dealing from the bottom of the deck against progressives every step of the way. See, we need to normalize progressive voices and issues again on the national stage. There's no Bernie to come to the rescue, but boy, oh boy, would he be an effective voice to engage in support of some alternate ticket. A contested convention has the ingredients of some captivating television if we can program the schedule under the noses of the DNC and deliver an August surprise that sets us up for success in 2028. No matter how you slice it, Democrats are going down in November because the American people are underwater. Also, George Clooney said so. It's time for progressives to grab a mitt and get in the game. This electorate is yearning for an alternative. But if we don't beat back the front line of defense in our own house, we'll never even get to the dance. I mean, we're in the Empire Strikes Back phase of the series once again, and it's gonna be a long slog back to the Oval Office and an even longer slog to winning back the American people to the ideas and the policies that have the potential to save lives and prevent the climate apocalypse. So let's get started. And here endeth the lesson. For a full list of sources and resources, head over to unftr.com. There, you can read through our archive of articles and essays, sign up for our free weekly newsletter covering progressive news from around the world, and browse our directory of progressive resources. To support our work, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. You can also tip us here on YouTube or check out the website to give one-time donations or become a member like these fine folks.